Welcome to San Antonio's Influence Magazine show, the premier talk show where we introduce you to influential individuals doing significant work in the city of San Antonio and surrounding areas. Celebrate the spirit of business, leadership, and innovation. Galveston, Texas, the headquarters of Juneteenth. Juneteenth National Holiday. I'm your host, Cedric Fisher, here with my wonderful bride, Miss Lola Fisher, editor of San Antonio's Influence Magazine Show. Come along with us as we introduce you to the NIA Cultural Center, led by Samuel Collins III and his fine staff. I am BOI, which is born on the island. Uh, that's something that the locals pride themselves in. Uh, but I want to uh, help you to feel comfortable you are BOI too, born off island. So we all BOI, no division here, we all come together. Um, grew up on the mainland in Hitchcock, uh, graduated, went to Texas A&M University, got my degree in accounting. Professionally, I'm a financial advisor, uh, but here at the NIA Cultural Center Juneteenth Legacy Project headquarters, I am a volunteer, certified tourism ambassador and local historian. Uh, often known around here locally as Professor Juneteenth. The Neocultural Cultural Center was organized by our executive director in 1992, Ms. Sue Johnson. Uh, there was a great deal of violence here on the island and the Cultural Center was organized to kind of engage the youth and give them some positive options of alternative uh, things to do here on the island and to uh, give them some pride in their own culture and heritage. So the NIA Cultural Center had been working on the island for basically 30 years before the Juneteenth Legacy Project uh, was organized in the fall of 2020. Mm -hmm. So the Juneteenth Legacy Project was organized specifically to complete the Juneteenth Mural Project on the southwest corner of 22nd and Strand, which is the um, basically ground zero for where the Juneteenth story began. So there's a Juneteenth marker on the corner, but we decided to do a Juneteenth mural to expand the narrative. And instead of competing with the local nonprofit uh, by organizing a new nonprofit that sucked resources and assets out of the room, uh, we decided to partner with a, a nonprofit that had been in, in existence, which was the NIA Cultural Center. At the same time, um, once the mural was completed, this retail space was open uh, because the store that was here before had closed. And we worked with uh, Mitchell Historic Properties who owns the building. They gave us permission to put the mural up and then they gave us permission to uh, establish an art gallery. So the goal of the art gallery was to take a space uh, in this 2200 block uh, and change the energy in the sense that this is the block in which enslaved people used to be auctioned. So Maya Angelou has a quote, history despite its wrenching pain cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage need not be lived again. So what our goal was is to create a platform in which the artists can showcase their work and be rewarded for their labor. So where most galleries may take 50 to 60% of proceeds from a sale, here at the Neo Cultural Center Juneteenth Legacy Project headquarters, we give the artists 80% whenever they make a sale and we ask them to donate 20% back to the Neo Cultural Center. We put buyers in direct contact with the artists. So they buy from the artists, there's no middleman, and then the artists give a donation back to the Neo Cultural Center. So we also seek funding through grants uh, to keep the space open uh, because uh, changing the consciousness of the community to value art, history, and culture takes time. Um, oftentimes people are looking for prints, but it is our goal to help the artists sell their original works. Not only do we celebrate professional artists, we also have youth art auctions where we start auctions at $100 in increments of $10, and we have children get involved in the most, uh, or the highest price auction that we've had for one of the youth's painting was $250, and that student uh, also picked up two additional commissions 
at that event. So we're showing them that they don't have to accept minimum wage jobs. They could use their talent and gift to create economic opportunity for themselves. So we're teaching them the business of art, uh, the beauty of art, and the power of art. So the Nia Cultural Center is here to educate, empower, and enlighten. So we are, as I stated, located on the southwest corner of 22nd and Strand where the Juneteenth story began. Many individuals do not realize that Gordon Granger did not ride into Galveston on a horse. He sailed into Galveston on a ship. And when he docked in the bay, they got off the ships and came downtown to the commercial district, which is where the Strand area is. He set up his headquarters in the Osterman building, on the, which is no longer there because it got hit by a tornado during Hurricane Carla in 1961 and eventually had to be torn down. But when Granger arrived in Galveston on June 19th, there were already many Union soldiers here. Newspaper reports from 1865 state that Galveston is occupied by Negro troops. Further down in the uh, document, dated 20th of June, which was the day after June 19th, 1865, it states Galveston is now occupied by colored troops constituting a provost guard for the enforcement of law and order. So here again, it lets you know that they did not come to inform, but they came to enforce. It's not that the news was late, but it was late to be enforced. And these Union soldiers, United States colored troops, many of them came into Galveston, spread the message here in Galveston first, and then moved further inland in the state of Texas to the plantations from county to county. Because Galveston only had about 1,200 enslaved people on the island, on June 19, 1865. When we talk about 250,000, uh, maybe 300,000, some estimates of enslaved people, they were further inland on the large plantations that grew sugar and cotton. Galveston is an island. The sand and the soil is not conducive to growing sugar and cotton. So many of the wealthy individuals lived here on the island, but they own plantations further inland. So the majority of the Union soldiers in Galveston were black soldiers, United States colored troops. But this has been left out of the narrative of our history books. It's not taught in our seventh grade Texas history, our high school US history, none of the college courses that I took when I was in college at Texas A&M University mm -hmm. explained to me that many of the soldiers bringing the message of freedom to Texas and to the many plantations were USCT. By January of 1866, military reports state that there are 6,500 white soldiers in Texas, 19,768 black soldiers. That is a three to one ratio. 75% of the Union forces by January of 1866 were United States colored troops, black soldiers fighting for their own freedom and saving this country and nation. They were patriots. They were U.S. soldiers wearing a U.S. uniform, defeating a military force in a country that had taken up arms against the United States. So they brought Texas back into compliance. They were winners. They were successful and they were not waiting to be saved or rescued. They were saving themselves, their family in this country. There were actually uh, soldiers in Texas, in South Texas, as early as 1862, Union soldiers, black and white. Uh, but this, ha again, has been left out of our history books. And we don't talk about the contributions of those soldiers. In Texas, we're taught to remember the Alamo. And the Alamo was actually a loss. But we're taught to remember the Alamo for the courage of those that fought for what they believed in. We should be taught about these winners that were part of the United States Army and, and military. Uh, not only the Army, but the Navy uh, in Galveston. Uh, Galveston was actually under Union control as early as October of 1862. They had control of the port in the city. But on January 1st, 1863, you have a Battle of Galveston in which the Confederate Army defeats the Union Army and Navy and takes back control of the city, therefore delaying enforcement of the Emancipation Proclamation. So it's not that the news to Texas was late. The enforcement of the Emancipation Proclamation was late, but news was already here as early as 1862.
So here at the Neo Cultural Center, one of the things that we try to highlight is the stories of resistance also to enslavement. So this is an image of Lucy from 1858. This was an enslaved woman that fought for her own freedom. She ended up killing her owner and they hung her here in Galveston in 1858. So in January, she killed her owner. They had the trial and in March, they hung her. One of the things that we do with technology, we allow individuals to scan the QR code with their phone. It takes them to the original documents, newspapers, so that they can read for themselves. So here, we do not debate theory. We just go to truth because we believe the light of truth will help us to heal and move forward. It's not about theory and what we think we believe or emotion. It's just about the truth of the history that we try to share here. So here at the Mid Cultural Center, we do not only focus on negative darkness and pain from uh, the time period of enslavement, but we talk about success stories like John Rufus Gibson, longtime educator here on the island, became the second principal of Central High School in 1888 and remained principal from 1888 to 1936, which is 48 years as principal of one school in one city. Mr. Gibson came here as an educator to teach in 1882, ended up having over a 50 year career, 54 years. He had a presidential appointment in 1901 as Council General to Liberia by President William McKinley. We also have, of course, Jack Johnson, uh, the Galveston Giant, which is the most famous native son of Galveston. He became the best in the world when he became the African-American heavyweight champion on December 26, 1908. He held the title until 1915. So Johnson, many people compared to Muhammad Ali, but even Muhammad Ali had Johnson as a role model. Uh, Jack Johnson was not like Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was like Jack Johnson. But outside of the ring, he had two patents. He wrote his own autobiography. So he wasn't just an athlete. He was a very intelligent individual. I am an artist and a residence now here on Galveston Island. I'm here at the Nia Cultural Center um, just displaying some of my artwork amongst all this great artwork that they have in here. You really should check it out. This is an image that came out of my book, and it's just, you know, fun at Grandma's house. How back in the day, we roller skate, we get out there and do hand jive games and sing all these songs, you know, the tricycles and the Raggedy Ann doll, which I still kind of have till this day, but it just displays happier times. You know, this is what kids did, they played um, during that time. If this is your first time joining us and you'd like more information, you could find us at InfluenceSA.com. That's I-N-F-L-U-E-N-C-E-S-A.com. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest. And for this particular episode of the show, all future and past episodes of the show, pull up your YouTube search bar, toss in San Antonio's Influence Magazine show. That word is critical. Get that word in there. When you get there, please subscribe, give us a like or a thumbs up, and hit that bell so that you don't miss any future episodes of the show.